Jesus, you're so worthy, Lord. Jesus, you are my God. Lord, have mercy. that you would desire we live to be seen break down our pride and all the walls we built up inside earthly crowns and all our desires we lay at your feet we 
sees our whole life as worship, is everything, is with everything, with our whole life, our voice, the way we walk in this world, who we are, the character that we hold. Father, this is most pleasing to you. And Father, we give it, O oh Lord, to, in this morning, O oh Lord, at least in this very day, the day that we have is today. The time that we have is now. So Father, we praise you. We worship you, O oh God. O oh Lord, we worship you with everything that we have, O oh Lord. We want to walk in Romans 12.1. We want to walk as a, a generation that is called to worship you in spirit and truth, O oh God. And it's only by you and your spirit that empowers us. By your word, you educate us. You define who you are, O oh Lord, before our midst, O oh God. And we decide today that we're worshiping you, O oh Lord, with everything, O oh God. So will you be praised, O oh Lord? Will you be blessed in our minds and our hearts? Will you be blessed upon our lips that we may glorify you in this world, this broken world that needs a Savior, that needs a God to be steadfast in his love, and a God who is faithful in every bit of his character, that, oh Lord God, we may fully lay and lean and rely and depend on you, that we may have a tangible hope, oh Lord God. Lord, will you be praised, will you be blessed, will you have a smile, oh Lord God, in this morning as your people come together to worship you in spirit and truth with their whole life as a life living sacrifice for worship, oh Lord God, I pray, oh Lord blessed and we just praise you we praise you with this life we praise you with this praise we worship you today because you are our god we commit the truth that 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 you are our savior our king our lord our authority our our first love oh lord god and and father it's so blessed to our hearts oh lord i pray father god will you be blessed through your son jesus christ will you be blessed in your people today will you be shining in your glory today oh lord just thank you, O oh Lord, for this body, and I thank you, O oh Lord, for this service that we can come together by one spirit, by one faith, by one, with one voice, O oh Lord God, with one praise, O oh Lord God, as one body under Christ Jesus to worship. O oh Lord, I bless you, Lord, in such a, a, a gracious time, O oh Lord, that we're able to do it even in this country, O oh Lord, in this land, O oh Lord, that is still free. Oh Father, I bless you. We bless you as, as the body of Christ. Father, we be praised, we be glorified. I pray, Father God, that the world may know and confess with their mouth that you are Lord and King, Savior of all. Oh Lord, I bless you. I bless you, Lord. Does anybody agree with that prayer? Do we are we here to worship God? Father, I just thank you, and we pray blessings on this service as we worship, as we learn, as we teach, as we love one another, Lord God, let it please you, and Lord God, let us, let us just be, oh Lord, just tangibly have you today. I bless you, and we bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, your beloved Son, oh go ahead and head on to youth. Uh, Colin Sikora will be teaching today, so youth, go ahead and head out. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for praying for us. How many appreciate Kevin? He's a blessing to us, right? Right here. So, I want to welcome you today. I want to remind you that uh, not only do we have Sunday morning, uh, but we have, I think the Forge is going out tonight to the uh, cliffside, and uh, I believe a meeting tonight at 6 20 is what I was told, meet here at 620. Um, I also want to remind you that youth group meets Wednesday nights. Also, home groups are meeting this week. And uh, on your program, you can just look, look at those. You can just see Lansford group meets next Sunday, right? The Rodemakers meet today at 3.30. We got the Glover group meets today at 7 p.m. We have the Momarch group that meets a week from Tuesday. Is that right? 
and the Dayton group meets this Friday, right? If you're one of those leaders, stand up, or one of those leaders, just so people can see who you are. And they can say, tell me about this group, all right, about you guys, all right. Let's give our home group leaders a, a welcome, all right? I also want to say it's, it's Eric Tabota's birthday today. He's getting very old, all right? He's, I won't tell you how old he is, but he's closer to 50 than 40. I'm just saying, my, he's not quite there yet, but he's moving on up, all right? Anybody else have a birthday today? Anybody else want to admit it anyway? No, you want to admit it, I bet. I um, want to welcome our guest. If you're a guest here, I want to encourage you to meet somebody because the, the family, this is a family. We're not, we're not like an institution, we're a family. So I want you to, make, to, to meet people and to get to know people here. I want to encourage you um, on giving. You know, many times in the summer we travel and stuff. I just want to encourage you to stay faithful in your tithes and offerings. And there's three simple ways to give. Uh, you can give at the boxes by the door because we don't pass the plate. You can give at northwestfellowship.com. You can also uh, text your gift in, which is what I like to do, 512-213-1000. And uh, why do we give? Why do we do that? Why not just keep all of our money? What, why would we want to give our money away when we can just keep it all? It builds the kingdom. Yeah, absolutely right. Why else? What's that? It's not ours, yeah, it's not ours. It's like before the service, if I gave Marvin $100 before the service, which I didn't, did I? Oh, you didn't, know. But if I gave Marvin $100 and then he, when, during the offering time, gave that $100 away, would you say, Marvin's so generous? Well, he is, but it wasn't his, it was given to him. I mean, oh, God given us everything, he wants us to, to honor him with our wealth, all right? Because he has something he wants to do through it, build his church, but out of the church, he wants to touch the world for Christ. We have, uh, we have about 10 missionaries that we are uh, supporting in various ways, and most of them financially, and we, we need your help to help support them as well. So I want to pray over our offering. Father, you are the God of abundance. You have everything we need. You said that you meet our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. There is no need in heaven. Nobody is needy in heaven. And so, Lord, we know that our needs here make way for your greatness. So we trust the promise that my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. And so thank you, Father, for that promise. Thank you also that you fulfill that promise through the hearts of people that give. Lord, I've never gotten a check written from heaven yet, but I have gotten checks Lord, that you wrote from people to, to do the ministry. It's all yours, God. We want to honor you with our wealth and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, stand up and greet someone you do not know and learn their name, all right? Say hi. Welcome them to Northwest Fellowship. Tim, Tim, mute, mute the guitar.
I'm cool.
Thank you, Debbie, Jacobs, and Dave, and all the, let's give the ensembles, give them another hand, all right? Thank you, Lord. Well, to get your outline out, we're going to continue our, I'm going to pray for us. If you can turn on the lights while I pray, how about that? Father, thank you for the Word of God that always produces that which you sent it to do. And you have a work to do today, God, in our lives, in our hearts, in our families. Lord, a a work of the Spirit of God. A work of uprooting, a work of healing, a work of delivering. You have a work to do right here, right now, Lord, through your word. We thank you, Lord, that we don't have to wonder whether your word will get it done. Your word will get it done. So thank you, God, in advance for the Word of God that will produce faith in in me, Lord, and faith in all those who hear the Word of God today, and that they would, Lord, that our our hearts would, would leap for joy because Jesus is Lord and that we are your people, God. And I pray, Lord, I pray this Word over us that you kept bringing into my heart while we were worshiping. I pray peace, Lord, over your people. God, I pray peace over the storms of their life. God, I pray peace over the divisions. I pray peace over, Lord, the broken areas of their heart and minds. And I ask, Holy Spirit, Prince of Peace, that you would overwhelm us today with your peace of knowing that you're God and you're in charge and that we can trust you. It's not a fake peace, but it's a true peace. And it's in our hearts because you, oh God, are the Prince of Peace. Would you work a a work in people today? Lord, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Jude. It's the last, next to the last book in the Bible. The amazing thing about this book is that it's only one chapter. It's 25 verses. So, you want to read a whole book in the Bible today? You want to do that? Let's just do that. It's not all on your outline, but maybe, maybe we can get up on the screen the whole book of Jude. I'll just start reading. I might make a few comments along the way, but we're going to focus towards the end here, the last few verses. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. Jude was also a a half-brother of Jesus. James was Jesus. I mean, they had same mother, different fathers, you know, right? Right, so Jesus' father was was God. And so um, to those who are called beloved, say we're called beloved. In God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. To those who are called and beloved and kept. That's us. May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write you, to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. I wanted to write you about our common salvation and and rejoice about it, but I had to write you that you would contend in your faith. Contend, fight for this faith, the true faith that was once delivered to us by the Lord Jesus. Why is he saying we must contend for this faith that has been passed down to us? Why is he saying that? I'm asking for a response here. You can talk back at church, all right? There's so many falsehoods that have entered in. He's saying, I wanted just to write you and celebrate our salvation, but I'm, I'm sending you some warnings here to prepare you so that you would hold on to the true faith. And then he goes on. This is a great book to study. It's a little book. I want you to look into it when you get home because we won't have a chance to look into all the intricacies of it today. I found it necessary to write to you, appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once delivered 
to all the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. So the, the two errors that he's bringing up are that the people that have come in and crept in and gotten the weave their way into the body is they do two things is they pervert the grace of God into sensuality saying oh because of God's grace you can do whatever you want oh God's grace oh but God's grace he covers it and, and we know God's grace does cover it but God's grace doesn't cause us to have a license to do whatever we want how many know what I'm talking about God's grace enables us to, to not sin and God's grace enables us to hate sin when we do sin. And God's grace enables us to be forgiven when we, when we do sin. Are you with me? So the two errors are that they've turned the grace of God into sensuality. And the second one is that they have denied our Lord Jesus. All right? So it's a really a good test for, for a ministry that you're, you're into or that you listen to or that you read two tests. What do they do with the grace of God? Is the grace of God just just only for us, enablement for us to sin? Or is it, does it mean that that God's grace makes us holy? God's grace does forgive us, but it's it's, it's not a cheap grace. How many know what I'm saying? It's a grace that causes us to love God more. And the other thing is, who's exalted in this ministry? Is it Jesus who's with them? Is it their name you hear most about, or is it Jesus? Who's high and lifted up? It's a great thing to think about for us. Who do you talk about most? Who's the, who's the one that's the hero of your life? Remember, over and over, don't miss this little, simple little teaching that one of my pastor friends told me. He didn't know he was teaching me, but he was. And he said, there's three scenarios that everybody's living, and I've said it to you over and over. Listen, either you're the victim right now in your life, you're the victim. Life's so hard and you're the victim. How many have ever felt like the victim? Raise your hand. All right, welcome among some people. But how many know we're not the victim, right? In Jesus, we're more than conquerors. So either you're the victim or you're the hero. Where you are, oh, look what I've done. You know what I've done? You know how much money I have? You know, look at my car, look at my look, look how good I look, right? Look what I've done. And so it's all about you. And sometimes, many times, we talk about ourselves a lot because we don't think we're that good. We make much of ourselves because we really don't think we're that much. We want others to make much. How many know the way to to, to feel good about yourself is for God to be God and you to forget about yourself, right? The best way to pursue greatness is to pursue God and let him, if he wants to make you great, whatever. But it's not about you anymore. It's about him, right? But the third scenario is what we want. We want Jesus to be the hero. And the way you know what scenario someone's living is you listen to what they say they may say all day long well I love Jesus I love Jesus but when you listen to their their conversation it's about how hard it is and how they're a victim and how life's not fair and they've been treated fair and their parents weren't fair and they weren't fair and they weren't fair how many know God can heal the wounds from your parents they may be big how many know God can heal the wounds of others God can can turn it into a testimony. And when your greatest pain has become a great testimony, you know God's at work. Are you with me? When these scars that you have, these scars that you have are now a testimony, but not say, look how scarred I am. Look how hurt I've been. No, no. Look how great Jesus is that he heals broken people. He heals wounded people. Isn't our God great? Come on, let's give him a hand right here at church. Well, I won't have time to, to even read this whole little chapter because of, of the great things that are here. But the two warnings are that we don't want to take grace and use it as a license to sin. And the other warning is we don't want to deny Jesus, his greatness. And those really go together. If someone's messing up on the grace of God, they're messing up on who Jesus is. But see, the, the story ends, and I just want to read the last few verses, then we'll go back up and fill in some of the blanks here. Look at Jude 24. It's, it's on your outline. It's towards the end. And so after all the warnings, which there are a lot of warnings in here, a lot of warnings. How many are glad God gives us warnings? How many are glad if you're on a, I mean, you ever been on 2222? 
between 360 and Mopac, you ever been on that road? It goes like this. You know, people say, you know, oh, you know, we don't like, we don't like there to be, you know, warning. Well, I'm glad there's those warning signs that say slow down, because if not, you might find yourself going off the cliff. Those, those guardrails there aren't legalism, right? They're there to protect you. So these warnings are, are meant for our good. Not to ruin our life, but to protect our lives. But here's the promise that he gives at the end, and I want you to see the context of it, because he warns over and over to, to, to not fall into many of the traps that they fell in the Old Testament. You see, the Old Testament was given so that we would learn. They were given so we could have an example, so we could, we could learn from their mistakes. How many would rather learn from somebody else's mistakes than from your mistakes, all right? And that's a wiser person that learns from somebody else's mistakes. Well, I want to tell you that false teaching and falsehood is unleashed upon the church in America today. You have to be very discerning and very, very uh, Berean. What do, I, what do I mean when I say Berean? Well, the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians because the Bereans, when Paul came and preached, they checked it all out and said, oh yeah, we, we like your ministry and stuff, but we're going to check it out with the Bible that we have. All they had was the Old Testament at the time, but they would ch always check out what was said with the Word of God, all right? So what you take is, is somebody preaches something to you, and it may sound great, and there may even be miracles attached to their ministry. doesn't matter. The, the Antichrist is going to do a ton of miracles in the last days. So don't ever go, oh, their, their, their ministry must be good because of their miracles. No, no. You don't ever judge a ministry by the miracles. You judge it by two things. By the word that is preached and by the lifestyle, the life of the preacher, the life of the believer, the fruit that's there. You look for fruit. What's the fruit there? That's, that's how you test a ministry. By the word that is preached and by the fruit that is there. That's how you test a ministry. All right? But at the end, he gives a promise. And the promise is in the context of great danger and a lot of lies and a lot of immorality and a lot of, of falsehood and a lot of twisting and a lot of, of, of mumbo jumbo, the things that are called God and they aren't. And he ends with this promise, Jude 24. Don't you read it with me? Ready? Now to him. Say it with me. Ready? Now to him who is able to keep you from he's able to keep you from stumbling it goes with the grace of God God's grace can keep you from stumbling God can keep you from stumbling how many are glad for that how many say well you know we're, I'm just going to keep falling to that same sin the Bible says that God can keep you from stumbling you don't have to fall to that God can lead you not into temptation he can deliver you from evil he can, he can truly do that work in you so now to him, let's say this, this is the promise, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with, we've talked a lot about how the Lord um, through Jesus, through his blood makes us righteous. And the only way to stand blameless before God is to stand with the blood of Jesus as your righteousness. This is why, if you're a true believer, if you're truly saved, you're always welcome to the throne of God because you don't approach Him based on your righteousness, but you approach Him based on Jesus' righteousness. But when you're there, you're there fully allowed to come with great joy. The Lord may convict you of your sin, but how many know when God convicts you of your sin, that's a good thing. How in the world did we somehow get away from preaching truth and conviction upon people? Conviction is the best thing that could ever happen to you. If you don't get convicted of something, my friend, you're in grave danger. If you can sit through a message, if you can go to a church and sit through a message and not feel conviction of the Spirit, whew, that's not good. It's not good. Because we need to be convicted so that we can be confess our sin so that we can be healed of our sin so we can turn from our sin how many do agree with that let's give the lord a hand that he loves to bring conviction to us but the promise here is now to him who's able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy i want to stand before god blameless before him with great joy don't you 
That's how I want to stand. I want to stand blameless before Almighty God with great joy. Let me just ask a question, all right? This is for you to think about. You know, sometimes we go to church and we don't ever think. We just like write down stuff. We don't ever use it. The brain is never engaged. I love that. To say, don't, we should have a sign out there. Don't check your brain at the door, all right? Bring it on in with you and start using it. All right? Word of God, many times it goes against our logic, but God wants us to think because he wants to renew our mind. He wants our mind to think differently than we used to think. So why do you think Christians, that's us, okay, that's us, why do you think we have so little joy? I don't want quick answer, I'm not answering quickly, I want you to think. Okay, and it, but let me make it more personal. Why do you think you have so little joy and me have so little joy? When God, Almighty, the King of the universe, has an infinite amount of joy available to us. What are the things that are keeping us from experiencing joy in this life? Right here, right now, what are the, what are the enemies of the joy that God wants to unleash in us? This is the question I want you to ask. I want you to pray and ask, because the Lord wants to, to give more joy to his people. One of the most amazing promises, I mean, one of the most amazing scenes in Acts was when uh, Peter and John wouldn't stop preaching, and they were beaten. Anybody ever been beaten for sharing the gospel? I haven't met too many. Um, I've met a pastor here, John Monger, of, a, of a, an international church here in town that's been in prison two different times. Um, for preaching the gospel in India and uh, I think Burma, uh, I think it was Burma, which Miramar, he was in prison twice. And I wanted to share a story sometime with you, but most of us have never been in prison for sharing our gospel. But Peter and John were beaten and it said they, re they left rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name. So, so, so afflictions shouldn't steal our joy, right? Afflictions can be even part of the circumstances that we throw in and say, but God, you're greater. But God, you're doing something. But God, you're greater. I think, well, let me just hear a couple answers. We got a little time here. So let me think, why do you think we experience a little joy? Deanna? We're not abiding. Yeah, we're going to get there today. Um, we're going to get there. Yeah, we don't abide. Yeah, we we're, we're, we. we we, we come to church, we have an experience with God, but then we leave and we, 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 there's no abiding. We're not drinking, we're not taking and eating. It's like if you came, and, we, and this would be cool, wouldn't it? And we had one of those amazing buffets every Sunday. Like, you ever been to Shoney's back in the old days? They had Shoney's, man. You go to Shoney's, boy, you can eat, dude. That's why they went out of business. Some of us ate them out of business. You go and you just eat this giant buffet on Sunday morning, and then it's over, and then you don't eat again until next week. And you go, but, but I had so much food on Sunday, but I'm starving by Monday. And I get grouchy when I get hungry, and I'm grouchy. And you Just think, you know, I talk to people and they say, when I fast, I get grouchy. Well, God wants to get the grouch out of you, right? So maybe fast a little more, right, so you can get that grouch out of us. Well, spiritually, when we're hungry for God and we're not nourished, the flesh begins to come out because we don't have strength and we lose our joy. And we, we, yeah, there's so many, so many, so many things, so many reasons. But the main one is that we're not really drawing the life of God from the Holy Spirit that he wants to bring to us. So he made a promise to children of God that I'm gonna, I can keep you from stumbling and I can present you and I will present you before my throne with great joy in my presence. That's what he said right here. So he says, there's all these attacks going on in all these lives, but I'm going to, I'm going to help you conquer them. Verse 25, to the only God and Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forevermore. Why can we conquer? We can conquer because Jesus conquered. All right? 
All right, I'm just going to do a little response here. I'm going to, and you're going to say, because Jesus conquered. How can we conquer fear? How can we conquer division? How can we conquer lies? How can we conquer insecurity? Because Jesus conquered. How can we conquer the devil? How can we conquer ourselves? See, the biggest enemy I face, really, it's really not the enemy, it's me. Because the Bible says when you're tempted, don't blame the devil. Because he's just playing on your wicked desires. So, and, and listen, this is, the, this is the trap. Remember I said a few weeks ago I, that you, you don't hear people preach holiness anymore. And you know why? That's, a, that's terrible. Because with holiness, with the experience of holiness comes joy. And so why do you think the Church of America has so little joy? Because I don't know, I, one, of the, one of my pastimes is I've read a lot about the church in, in, in other places, even the persecuted church. And I recently had you, and, and we'll see a movie this January when it comes out on video, but about Wormbrand and about all the joy that happens to all these people that are in prison and solitary confinement and, and beaten for they still have joy why because there's the joy that is supersedes these circumstances that god wants to give us so what do we do while we're waiting this joyous home we, i mean like you go i can't wait to have fullness what do we do how do we experience more now of god this is what i'm going to tell you okay the promise is god's going to can keep you from falling and he can present you before his glorious throne with great joy but here's the response before that a few verses before what do we do till then all right let's read at the top of your outline but you must remember beloved the predictions of the apostles of our lord jesus they said to you read this part in the last time there will be we're in the last times now there'll be scoffers what does that mean mockers they're going to mock you. When you say Jesus is the only way, they're going to mock you. Oh, Christ, are you kidding? Jesus is not the only way. I mean, come on, that's ridiculous. Following their own what? They're following their own. And you know why most people want to talk you out of Jesus? Because they don't want to be convicted by your godly life. And it was true before I was saved. I didn't want my friends getting saved because I didn't want to be convicted by the, by the God that I knew was there. It is these who cause divisions. These people who are after worldly things, these are the ones that cause divisions. Worldly people devoid of what? This is what we must have is the Spirit. Look, please, there's two kinds of people on the earth. Only two kinds. Believers in Jesus. And to, to be a believer means you're filled with the Holy Spirit. To be an unbeliever means you're not filled with the Holy Spirit of God. That's the difference. That's the distinct difference. So if the Holy Spirit is what makes us a Christian, it's the Holy Spirit, it's as the person of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not an it, the Holy Spirit is not a force. The Holy Spirit is God Almighty. He's equal to God the Father and God the Son. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three persons but one God. How many know this is a divine mystery? How do we understand it but by, by falling down and worshiping? I mean, can you imagine having a God that you could understand everything about him? You wouldn't want to serve a God like that. You would be God if you could understand everything about God. So you say, I don't understand why God would, is so mysterious. Because he's God. And because he's going to fulfill you forever. It's going to be forever. You'll never be unfulfilled. In heaven, you're going to be constantly awestruck by the glory that Jesus reveals of himself forever they said in his last time there'll be scoffers following their own ungodly passions it is these who cause divisions worldly people devoid of the spirit but you say but you but you but, they don't have the spirit but you say but you look at someone say but you you see these ungodly people they're doing stupid things they're not filled with the spirit but you but you're different this is what I want you to do while you're waiting on that joyous day when you stand before me and you stand before me and I've cleansed all your sins and burned up all your works and you stand before me with great joy because I have made a way for you and you have finally finished your race. How many of us going to be a glorious day, huh? 
But until then, what do we do? He says, but you, beloved. Say beloved. I love that. I love that. When, I mean, it's such a tender way that Jesus speaks to us. Beloved. I mean, Jesus calls you his, his love, the one he loves. But you, beloved, building yourself up in your most holy faith. Remember, this is I, I wanted to write you about our great salvation, but I couldn't because there's too many enemies. So I had to write you about the faith that we must contend for, the true faith, because there's so many liars coming in to twist, and I'm writing you so that your faith will be growing and ignited in you. And here's what happens. But I want you to build yourself up or grow or become stronger in your most holy faith, and here's how you do it. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Number one, since God has us, and he's made a way for us. What should we do? Number one, write this down. We can now pray. We can now pray in the Holy Spirit. What does this mean? This is a mystery. This is the shortest book of the Bible. One of the shortest. There might be a shorter Old Testament book from one of the third Johns or something. Second, It's a very short book, but a great mystery. It says, I want you to build yourself up praying in the Holy Spirit. You're like, what? What? What does that mean? Okay, so can I give you a a couple of answers that would be answered out there? Okay, so if you went around and surveyed 100 pastors and said, what does it mean to build yourself up in your most holy faith praying in the Holy Spirit? A certain portion of those pastors that would come from a more charismatic Pentecostal background would say, that means praying in tongues or praying in your prayer language. You'd say, I don't even believe in that. Well, you need to believe in it, all right, because the Bible says that God gives gifts to men, amen? But it's, it's clear from the scripture that God doesn't give one gift to every person, all right? So it's a beautiful gift, but, but, but it, it, it's, it's a gift that he gives to the body as he wills, but not everybody gets that gift. But the charismatic Pentecostal people would say that praying in the Holy Spirit means praying in this prayer language that God has given you. And, and I would say... There's truth there, right? It's true. So if, you, if God has given you the gift to pray in, in the gift of tongues or whatever, pray that way, all right? Pray that way. The Bible, don't, don't press the gifts down. In fact, listen, I have this burden because the Lord, I won't go into all of it, but in 1987, the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night and spoke to me powerfully that he was going to use my life and, and, and the ministry that he gives me as a bridge between charismatics and evangelicals. Some of you, this, this language means nothing to, but others of you understand what I'm saying. But there's people over here that are the charismatic, they believe in the gifts of the Spirit. There's people over here that they love the Word of God, but they don't really into the gifts of the Spirit. And there's just a division in the body of Christ. But God says, I want to bring the people together in spirit and in truth. And that's where we're going to see the greatest power unleashed upon the earth is when we have the Spirit and the Word together. Amen? Amen. Yeah. And so, I think there's a grave danger. Now listen to this, okay? So I follow a bunch of guys on Twitter and stuff. In the, the Twitter feed the other day, the guy said, make sure that the church you go to, that it's like the Bible. That's what he said, something like that. He said it better than that. But you know, I think I know what he was saying. Do you know what I think he was saying? Make sure they preach the truth. Make sure they hold to the Bible. Make sure they hold to the Word of God. How many believe that's true, right? You need to go to a church that preaches the Word and holds up the Bible. Are you with me? But what he may not have meant, he may not have meant your church needs to look like the book of Acts. Where if people come in that are demon-possessed, you cast out the demons. And if someone's sick, you pray for them that they can be healed. You see, he may want the Bible, but he may not want all the Bible. You see, we're all skewed in the way we see this. And so we want to be a church and among churches in our city who hold to the Spirit of God and all the gifts of the Spirit. But we test every one of the gifts and everything He does with the Word of God. It's Spirit and it's truth. It's both. How many know we got to have both, all right? And so so this is where a lot of our problems get because someone's into the gifts of the spirit and stuff and they're into like prophecy and stuff which is very biblical acts 2 says when the spirit of god is poured out upon the church your your children are going to be prophesying 
And if you don't believe that, you're not biblical. But one of the, the gravest things I've seen and almost never addressed, almost never addressed, is the people that say we believe the Bible, but we don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit. Well, how can you believe in the Bible and not believe that the Holy Spirit still does stuff? So it's very easy, it's very easy for the, the evangelical church, which I'm a part of it, I feel like I stand in the middle of these two, it's very easy for the evangelical to say, look at those crazy charismatics, they're, they're crazy. Someone's not a heretic because they believe different you on the gift. They're a heretic if they deny Jesus and deny the salvation of Jesus. But it's, there's a grave danger for me as a pastor and leader to someone who says that some of the Bible is not true. And not, not happen, that's dangerous. And it's hardly ever brought up. So there's two sides to fall, two ways to fall off the wagon. One is to fall out here and like, woo, we're just going to swing from the chandeliers and, you know, woo. And the other side over here is you have dry, dead orthodoxy where you preach the word and it's harsh, but there's no spirit, there's no life in it. And I've been to churches like that. And the word is preached. And you leave and you go, I feel dead on the inside. Why? Not because the word wasn't preached. Because the spirit of God wasn't allowed to do his work in us. Are you with me? So there's two ways to fall off this wagon. But that's not, we, want to, we don't want to fall off the wagon here. We want to stay in the middle here with Jesus. But here's the deal. To build yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. It could involve tongues, but... But that's not the only interpretation of it. What I believe, because it says in Ephesians 6, in the armor of God, ladies, it, was that lady studied, did, did she talk about praying in the spirit at all times as a part of the armor of God? Do you remember that? Many times we talk about the armor of God, we forget that he ends with this giant, giant admonition to live full of the armor of God. We got to pray constantly in the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Well, Here's what it means, in part, in Romans 8, 26 and 27, please jot that down as a reference. The Bible says that you and I are too weak to pray as we should. But the Holy Spirit will enable us to pray with groans too deep for words. In fact, sometimes it's not even words. I mean, I spend a lot of time praying and also praying with people in corporate body. Sometimes we, we're going to get to the point where we don't have words like, oh God, ah! And they're just groans on the inside and the Holy Spirit is taking those groans and he's saying, I'm going to interpret them back to God and I'm praying through you with, with groans too deep for words, but I'm praying through you the perfect will of God. So listen, I want to say this to people in here because, you know, we've been pursuing this prayer deal and some people are like, I'm not, I'm not too into that. Listen, the best prayer warriors are the weakest prayers. The people say, oh, I know how to pray. I can do this. No, no, a lot of times we'll get into pride like the Pharisee did when he was like, oh, Lord, thank you that I'm not like this old sinner over here. And oh, I got it all together. And the sinner's like, ah, I can't even pray. Ah. And Jesus said the sinner, the tax collector, went home justified and the Pharisee went home unjustified. Just because someone can pray real excellent prayers doesn't mean God empowered those by the Holy Spirit. You know what true prayer is? It's real. It's broken before God. And it's empowered. Lord, I don't know how to pray as I should. Would you let the Spirit pray through me? What do you want me to pray, God? What do you, what do you want coming out of my heart as I cry out? Build your faith up by praying in the Holy Spirit. Your faith grows, yes, by hearing the Word of God. But this passage through the Word of God says... That build yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Spirit. I think I'm, I don't think I'm going to go further than that. Because listen, because I want to talk to you about this a little bit. Because almost you never hear about this. And I've been a part of, of studying the prayer movement and lead, helping lead a prayer movement and now being involved with what God's doing around. Hardly ever do you hear anyone talk about this. We talk about prayer. It's almost like you need to gut it up, sis. You need to get up, you need to get, up, get out of that bed in the morning, get up and, and force yourself. You don't want to pray, but force yourself to do it and make yourself do it. And, and a lot of times I feel like a lot of the, the discipline that we're trying to encourage the church with is, is literally man-centered and flesh-driven. 
And that's why it doesn't last more than a week. How do you know that there's a move of God, a move of the Spirit inside of someone? It doesn't stop. I believe this. I'm about to tell you something. I believe. When God gives you a word from Him, from His word, a word that's truly a word from God, how do you test if someone gives you a word from God or you feel like God's... You always test it with the word of God and with the spirit of God. And a third test is you, you test it with people that you trust. These are three tests. When there's a word that comes to you, you test that word with the word of God, number one. Number two, with the spirit. Does that, does that sound like God? Does that... Does, do, does my heart say, yes, this is God? Does my heart agree because my heart has the Holy Spirit? But sometimes you need to say, listen, brother, I trust you and, and you three guys here. This is what I feel like God said to me. Does it sound like God to you? All right. But when God speaks to you, listen, a word. This is why you got to listen. When he speaks to you, it, the, the work of that word, does never, it never stops. It never stops. Now, the enemy will come and try to steal, kill, and destroy. But when God begins to implant his word inside of you, he is not going to allow, and it can get choked out, I get that. But when God implants a word in us, I'm not talking about when you just hear it, you're an unbeliever, but when you get a word planted in you, God is going to bring about that word which he put in you. And that's why we have to listen to him and find out what it is. And many of us, many, many are so frustrated because we have not stopped to hear what God wants to say to us. And if you'll stop and listen, it'll revolutionize your life. My whole life was changed. And Marianne and I, we were walking in uh, Cedar Park the other day, and we just happened to walk this route that we'd walked 10 years ago, standing in our light pole, February 17th, 1230 in the morning. And God said to me, Trey, wouldn't it be wonderful if 31 churches would adopt one day of prayer a month, and my city could be covered in prayer 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year until Jesus returns. When Jesus said that, he wasn't just trying to encourage me about this. He was calling me to help lead this. He was imparting something in me that was to have a result. Are you with me? God doesn't give you his word so it doesn't have a result. He gives you his word to cause a result. To break stuff in you, to change you, to break you out of stuff. You see, we we'd planted this church, and we were pretty much just like, we're happy. We, we're 15 years into the church plan. Everybody's good. We're, we're over here. We're doing our thing. And God says, no, no, Trey, I've got something bigger. You've got to connect with the body of Christ around the city because I've got something bigger I want to do in this city. It's way bigger than what you've seen, but it's what I've seen. Once I put that word in you, it's going to begin a work in you to cause you to become what I want you to become. How many know what I'm talking about, huh? And so this is, that's what we have to do. Lord, I don't know how to pray, but give me the Spirit. Let me pray the Spirit. Guys, we've got to figure this out. If we will figure this out, it'll help build our faith. So when you pray in the Holy Spirit, you don't pray in your strength. You don't pray in your, in your ideas. You just say, Lord, I, don't, I need your help to pray. Let me just tell you, just a, by example, okay? I'm not going to cover these rest of these points today anyway. But I want to tell you what happened to me. Last week when we were, I was preaching on abiding, which that, that message really, 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 really got me. Because you know what? We're all becoming what we're abiding in. If your life is messed up, you can't blame your mom or your dad. You can blame what you abide in. If your thoughts and your confusion, you can only blame that you've been abiding in the wrong stuff. If you're a Christian, it's time to stop blaming people and start going, what am I abiding in? See, you're all, we're all becoming what we abide in. Are you with me? And so last week as I was preaching and we were talking about abiding in the Lord and I was sharing the illustration of that we also either abide in the Lord or we abide in the world. And all of a sudden I took it, God said, hey, show this, sec this Galatians 5 and the fruits of the Spirit and the deeds of the flesh. And I went through the whole thing last week about that. The fruit of how, what it looks like when we abide. And here's what I did when I got home. And I invite you to do this. Because I think this is a part of praying in the Spirit. I got home and I was, I was like, oh God, you know what? I, if I'm abiding in Jesus, the fruit of the Spirit should come out in my life. If I'm abiding in Jesus, the fruit of the Spirit should be very evident in my life. Are you with me? It shouldn't be like... Come here, I think there's a fruit there somewhere. Come here, let's get the magnifying glass. We've got a fruit down there. 
fruit alert! Now, we, we do know that Jesus does prune us at times, right? So that we can bear what? More fruit, yeah. And in the end, he wants us to bear much fruit so that we can prove ourselves to be his disciple. You know how you prove you're a disciple? You bear fruit. You bear fruit. That's John 15. That's not Trey. You prove yourself to be a disciple by your fruit. How do you bear fruit? You can't go, I want to bear fruit. You abide in Jesus. You let Jesus' life flow through through you by his spirit and by his word. And all of a sudden, you begin to bear fruit. So here's what I'm praying, okay? I want to give you something you can do when you pray. Okay, the the two main ways I I want to teach you to pray is pray the Lord's Prayer. I've taught you that over and over. Second is, is pray about this. This is what I'm praying about, the fruit of the spirit. The fruit of the spirit is love. Say that with me. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And then it ends that passage to say there's no limit to this. There's no law against this. There's so you're never going to go, Tamara, you have too much love in your life. You, I don't want you to have any more. Because what God does when he pours his love into our hearts, he always gives us an overabundance of it. Why? So we can give it away. So we can overflow out of it. So he pours his love on us so that it's, it's overflowing. So here's the way I'm praying, okay? I want you to d- get this because it's helping me. And I've not gotten past the first fruit of the Spirit yet. Here's what I've been praying. Whenever when I have time during the day, I just say, Lord, Holy Spirit, would you be love to me? Holy Spirit, would you show me your love? Would you, would you be love in me? Would you be love to me? Would you show me what it's like to love? Would you, would you love me so I can love others? Holy Spirit, I can't love people apart from you. Holy Spirit, you said the fruit of the Spirit is love. So, Holy Spirit, I don't want to just know that in my head. Would you work love in my heart? I'm praying this. This is praying in the Spirit. Would you work love in Trey Kent? And you know what's weird? I've seen some of the fruit of that. And how does God test it? He'll always test you with someone beyond your comfort zone. You see, we like to have a neat little, sweet little Christianity that, oh, it was such a sweet time with God this morning. It was such a sweet time with God this morning. And then you go to work and your, your work associate's like a pain in the bonkers. You're like, God, what is this? I just had this great time with you. He says, no, the great time with me was to prepare you to love that person that is a pain to you. With a love you couldn't have had before. Are you with me? This is how God does it. He he blesses us and then he tests us. He blesses us and then he provides opportunity for us. He blesses us and then he provides challenges that are Goliath-sized. And we go, oh, this is easy. I've seen God kill the bear and the lion. This uncircumcised Philistine who has no covenant with God, he's going to go down today. Amen? Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. Amen? I just want to invite Eric up here and let's, let's don't sing. Let's, let's maybe play, but let's, let's turn the lights down and let's make this a place of prayer for a few minutes. If you don't know Jesus Christ, call out to him. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord with faith will be saved. You don't need some little way to do that. You need to cry out to him to save you if you're not saved. If you are a child of God, Would you join me either on your knees or at the cross or just as you sit there and pray, Holy Spirit, would you be love to me? Let's begin there. Holy Spirit, would you be love to me? Oh man, I feel the power of God. Lord, would you be love to us? So in just a moment, I'm not going to speak anymore, but I want you to Keep asking, Holy Spirit, be love to me. Love my heart. And then he'll bring up stuff that he wants you to confess or people he wants you to forgive. He begins to work. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is what it means to pray in the Holy Spirit. Letting him guide you. Let him lead you. Let him change you. Not you. Let him do the work. Holy Spirit, would you be love to me today? Would you show me how I need to be loved today? Would you pray these simple prayers? Holy Spirit, would you heal my heart today so that I can love people who hate me?
on, let's get on our knees before God. Let's let's go to the cross, wherever. Let's let's just let's just lay before the Lord for a few minutes and just ask Him to do His work right here, right now. Let's don't wait till five minutes to pray in the Spirit. Let's do it right now. Holy Spirit, come. feel like the Lord's filled you up. I'm still on love after a week, but when you feel the Lord's touched you, then go on to joy. Lord, Holy Spirit, be joy to me. Be joy in me. Holy Spirit, be peace in me. So don't rush through these because there's too much He wants to give you. Be patient in me. Holy Spirit, be patient. Stand on your feet. Sandy to share this briefly and because this is how the Holy Spirit works you see when he begins to work in us he begins to call us to obey him so I just I feel like she's convicted on an issue that it might be relevant for all of us and then we'll, we'll close I was feeling that there are many people in this room that have family member issues maybe unforgiveness or um, just not speaking to one another and my personal testimony is I have one, one sibling, a brother, he's two years older than me, and I've been estranged from him most of my life. Uh, when I was a teenager, I was a runaway, and I remember this one time he came to get me when I was trying to run away from home, and he told me he loved me, but that's when I was like 15. And all these years, he's not reached out to me. So I just kept avoiding him and avoiding him. About a year and a half ago, I got the courage to call him. 
And actually, I texted him because I was so weak spined about it. And I said, Donnie, why is it you never reach out to me? I send you texts, I send you emails, but you never reach back to me and try to be a family member. And he said, Sandy, it's not your fault. I have a communication problem. It's me. But I spent 30 some years not reaching out to him because I thought it was me and I was afraid to ask him because I was afraid he would say, well, you were the black sheep. You were the one that always caused all the problems. And so I'm just sick of you. I don't want to be involved with you. But it wasn't me, it was him. So as I was back there, I got on my knees and the first thing I heard was call your brother. And even after I, I you know, was told that it, he admitted it was him, I still didn't call him, I still didn't obey. I still didn't make that in this initiation to call him. And I just want to encourage you and pray for you and pray for me that we can reach out to those family members that we don't speak to because that's part of the problem here. So Father God, I just ask God that you would convict our hearts yes, to begin to love one another as you have yeah. loved us and that you would open our hearts up to forgive the family members that have hurt us that you would let us forgive them and you would let us make that first step of courage to reach out to them in Jesus' name, amen. Yes, amen, thank you. It's a very practical picture. Yeah, let's give the Lord a hand for that, amen. That's a very practical way that this works out is that God begins to work in our lives pouring his love into us. He begins to call us to do things, to forgive or to call or to express love. So we're going to dismiss, especially if you have children, we want to dismiss you to go grab your children. If you'd like to pray into this a little bit, we're going to just allow some time of prayer up here. Just say, I want, I, want, I want to bask in the Holy Spirit some more. This is where true awakening comes, when the Spirit of God is poured upon the hearts of men and women and takes root. So I dismiss you if you have children or you need to go. But if you want to pray into this, please stay here and pray. But let your conversations be kept out in the foyer. And let's keep this as a place of prayer for a few minutes. So God bless you. If you're dismissed, if you need to go. If not, let's turn this into a place of prayer in receiving what the Holy Spirit has for us. Have a great day. God